the national personifications of countries from around the world are gathered together and act out history. What would that look like? Maybe Uncle Sam, John Bull, and Mary Ann hanging out in a trench in World War I? A Russian bear growling at a bald eagle during the Cold War? Or, naturally, a bunch of cute anime boys. Welcome to the world of Italia, a show I struggle to call good despite the deep enjoyment it gives me. Why? Well, let me break down the show's weaknesses and strengths in this reflection and try to show how it manages to be an entertaining, if incredibly strange, anime. If you utterly hate Italia, fear not. I completely understand and feel your pain, but you're probably going to think I'm being too nice to it. If you totally love Italia, don't worry. I do actually like the show, despite what I'm about to say for the next few minutes. Though you're probably going to think I'm being too harsh on it, but let's just get into it. Italia has many weaknesses. Italia is just inherently bizarre. It's a show often focused on World War II history and the national personifications of the Axis powers. Sometimes it focuses more generally on world history with a more diverse group of national personifications, but it always comes back to Italy, Germany, and Japan. It's a pitch that might not fly, considering the era inside of history chosen is about as controversial as possible. However, Hitalia is able to be not only a decent show, but a humorous one through a very light tone with ridiculous and mostly accurate historical anecdotes. As such, Hitalia is one of those shows that is not often taken very seriously, but not just because of the tone. It's also associated with 13-year-old screaming fangirls who are obsessed with these fictional versions of countries and have their own liberal interpretations of history, which often come across as pretty offensive. Not that that sort of fandom actually interferes with your experience while watching, but it does keep potential viewers away and leave a bad impression on people even if they haven't seen it. The offense factor doesn't stop with silly preteens either. Italia stays clear of the inhumane and controversial parts of history, particularly in World War II, but to some, the mere idea of making light of national personifications within that era is too much. This is understandable, though if you have watched the show, it's fairly obvious the intent is comedic the entire time. Most World War II scenes involve the countries trying and failing to spy on each other, or Italy failing to train, or the Allies arguing about what their next plan should be, and getting caught up in completely irrelevant squabbles. It's not Ken Burns. It's an anime. Well, it is an anime, but very little of it seems to be actually animated. The amount of reused footage and almost completely stationary shots is overwhelming. The first time I watched the show, I thought my computer was glitching since it was the exact same scene from a previous episode. A scene where Italy, Germany, and Japan are stuck on a desert island and hang out by a campfire. This scene is repeated so many times throughout the season that they never seem to leave this stupid island. Italia isn't really a show that needs super fluid animation. There's no fight scenes really, but it's just lazy most of the time. The animation actually adds to the humor at points, but not in the way any of the animators possibly could have intended. One part of the series that always makes me laugh, despite it not being an actual scene that is intended to be funny, is the Six Seasons ending theme song, which features Italy dancing in the jankiest cut of a professionally made anime I've ever seen. It's actually so bad, it's really hysterical. I feel bad for the person at Studio Dean who looked over this and said, yeah, this is professional grade animation. Let's air this on television over and over and over again at the end of every single episode. Additionally, to make the show as confusing as possible, the episodes consist of several short historical skits. The amount of context as to what time period a skit is happening in is often insufficient to follow the events of what's happening. Some skits are part of continuing stories, told over several episodes, but not always in a chronological or a sensible order. For example, episode 17 is part one of a two-part story in which America reminisces on the American Revolution and his relationship with England. You would think episode 18 would feature the concluding part, but no, it can't be that simple. The second part comes in episode 20, so three episodes later for one, and within that episode it comes after two other skits featuring Germany teaching Italy to throw a grenade and England inventing things only to have other countries beat him to it. Only then do we get to see the end of that story arc, brief though it was. There's a couple of plot lines like this placed randomly and mindlessly through the episodes. The episodes are only five minutes, by the way. You'd think they'd be able to have one story for five minutes. But no, for four seasons, they could not figure out having a complete story in an episode makes it easier to understand and to follow. The last two seasons of the show tend to be a little better on this point by focusing whole episodes on one story or putting multi-part plots consecutively, a novel idea, I know. But the first few seasons, where most people start, are rough. 
And despite some several part stories within the show, there is no real overarching plot to Hitalia. At best, it's a very limited retelling of world history told in no particular order. Loosely connected historical scenes aren't necessarily bad, but it means that when starting out, the show is a baffling hodgepodge of countries and history. Basically, Italia makes itself as incomprehensible as humanly possible to a new viewer. That was the case for me. I dropped Italia. Multiple times. That was a incredibly long list of concessions, but I can't talk about Italia without discussing how flawed it is and demonstrating I understand and am aware of those flaws and am annoyed by them as much as anybody else. Despite that, I somehow have watched it all and somehow came out really liking it. So why? And how? Well, I first watched the show without having heard anything about it. I'd only recently got into anime and I saw it on Netflix and was willing to give it a shot. I watched about half of the first season dubbed. I tried to watch the multi-part stories in order after I figured out they weren't in order and skip some episodes whose descriptions didn't sound that interesting. But even doing that, it was not consistently enjoyable because of the aforementioned problems, so I quickly became frustrated with it. And as I said, I had only recently gotten into anime, so I wanted to move on to other shows I had heard were really good rather than something I couldn't completely enjoy. Yet I found myself wondering about Italia, about those moments that were so funny I would be doing something else and then just start laughing thinking about it. So I decided to give the show another chance. I rewatched the first half of season one and then finished it before moving on to season two called World Series and quickly dropped it again. The same problems as before just got to be too much for me. But I came back to it again after the jokes haunted me again. I managed to get through the second season that time by watching it in little bursts and kept going on to the third and fourth season and realized how to deal with Italia. I learned to stop worrying about it and just love the show. Just enjoy the best parts. While most Italia skits aren't as hysterical as the best ones, almost all are somewhat entertaining. Sit through those contently and take in the funniest bits. It's not a show worth agonizing over. Italia is super, super flawed. But I think it has something worth looking past, or better put, accepting its problems. Like I said, Italia is really funny. Sometimes it's laughing so hard your sides hurt funny. Other times it's small chuckle funny. But at minimum, it's usually a smile on your face funny. Of course, what is funny depends on a person's sense of humor, but enough people like Italia to make me think there's some humor there with a pretty wide appeal. So what makes it funny? First and foremost, Italia uses stereotypes perfectly. That's not a sentence I say very often, but it's true. Every national personification has elements of their country's perceived stereotypes. Every country. Meaning no country is left out of being lampooned. So if the stereotypes are actually really offensive, then at least they are uniformly offensive. But Italia's stereotypes are basically harmless. America is an obnoxious, loud country with a ridiculous amount of confidence. He eats too much and is obsessed with his weight. He's fixated on being the hero and has superhuman strength representing his power and influence that he's had from a young age. He's also pretty unaware of things happening outside America. Nor does he seem to care much about the rest of the world if it doesn't relate to him. England is reserved, can be rather critical, cannot cook for anything, and has friendships with the folkloric creatures of his country that he can only see, like unicorns and fairies. He's stubborn and naggy. He used to be a pirate, referencing the British Navy's prowess and the expansiveness of the British Empire, but now he's a gentleman. And he's serious frenemies with France. Speak of the devil, France is a bold Casanova, thinking himself far superior to other nations, appreciating his own fashion and food, He's a style over substance guy in pretty much all respects and laments the fact that he's not as powerful as he used to be. China is ancient and loves good food. He's very artistic and enjoys cute things like pandas and he's often carrying one. A running joke is that he can build a Chinatown wherever he goes. Germany is strict, stern, and straightforward. He loves his beer and his dogs and he gives orders efficiently and can take control of a situation when everyone else is fighting and being stupid. Russia seems to be easygoing with an almost childlike personality, but really is terrifying and is slightly unstable, stemming from the many tragedies his country experienced in his childhood, his childhood being early Russian history. He also loves vodka. Japan is even more reserved than England and is alarmed by open affection, his shyness branching from his long-lasting isolation from the rest of the world. He's fairly mature and also has a mysterious vibe. The central character of Italia, partially the namesake of the show, is Italy. Italia is a combination of the word hetare, meaning endearingly pathetic in Japanese, and Italia, the Italian word for Italy. 
Italy is a bit of a womanizer like France. He loves good food, particularly pasta, adores his art and culture, and is a pretty easygoing, happy guy. The one aspect of his character I didn't quite understand initially was how useless or endearingly pathetic Italy was. He is shown to constantly surrender and be pretty wimpy overall. I think this comes from the Japanese perspective. While someone in the US or UK would, oversimplifying historical details here, probably think of France as a country that was the weak link of the Allies in World War II, being occupied and controlled by the Axis for most of the war, from the Axis side, Italy was definitely the weak link. They were not really prepared for the war, and they did surrender first. Mostly, Italy is a fun, hyper, dorky country who infuriates but charms Germany, and is well liked enough by nearly everyone else. Oftentimes, just the simple interactions of so many contrasting personalities creates humor. For example, many episodes feature an allies meeting, where the US, China, Russia, England, and France try to strategize and end up arguing over something. Unlike the desert island scenes, this concept is changed completely every time, rather than reusing the exact same animation for every version of the scene. My favorite ally meeting is when America thinks he's arrived first to the meeting, preens himself about it, and then sees England has gotten there before him. He sees England drawing heads of the Axis countries that have always been on the blackboard in the background of all the other allied meetings. As much as I complained about the lack of solid storylines, Italia is actually pretty good at reincorporating running jokes and little details, like the head drawings that viewers would have seen. The episode plays out that America decides to draw little heads of the allied powers above the normal Axis heads, and when the rest of the allies see them, they think they're terrible. America pretends he didn't draw them while going on about how the style seems to be gorgeous American pop art and how it captures each nation's unique characteristics and everybody realizes he drew it. China draws a pretty drawing of himself to show America how it's done, but it's weirdly elaborate and feminine. Everyone's freaked out by it and that's it. It's pretty short, but it makes me laugh and it's basically what Italia does well. Vignettes that are simple and funny. Italia in general has very high highs. Scenes and jokes I find absolutely hysterical, but it also has very low lows. Most episodes involve one or more of the eight main characters I ran through in some capacity, but there's a pretty large cast of recurring side characters, some who are absolutely amazing. Canada is my definite favorite. Canada's existence is literally a joke. I am not kidding. The gag with him is that no one remembers he exists. No one can see him unless he makes himself known, and even then, countries can't figure out who he is. If they do see him, they think he's America, because he looks just like him. Canada is honestly angry about this, but he's too nice to do anything about it. America and Canada are brothers, a concept that's strange to apply to countries, but it helps to explain why they look so much alike. However, America seems to forget him just as much as everyone else. There's an episode where they play couch together, and America continuously hits him in the face, and the arms, and the legs with his ball. Canada protests weakly, saying he should take things slow, but America just laughs at him and says he's way too slow. Canada's pain, both literal and emotional, is just too funny to be sad. There are so many other characters, too. Austria is very stuffy, but loves the piano and has dramatical music numbers all the time. Switzerland is basically a hermit, always being neutral, but has a soft spot for his sister, Liechtenstein. Various micronations who aren't officially recognized are always trying to get attention. Australia has this evil-looking koala with him, always. The list goes on and on and on. I'm just scratching the surface because there's so many great characters and funny moments that this video would be incredibly long if I tried to cover them all. Honestly, funny comedy is the main reason I think Italia is good despite, you know, everything else. A second reason to watch it is its sweet and touching moments. Even though Italia is a comedy, it has a few compelling moments that give a little more depth to the nations. A few are humorous as well as touching. In one episode, Italy explains he's borrowed and modified Germany's car to help him escape out of any situation. Germany is mad, but asks to see the modification. And Italy presses random buttons, and then his seat is ejected from the car and he disappears into the sky. This is ridiculous, but par for the course for Italia's weird humor. And it made me laugh. But it was Germany's reaction that really makes the scene amazing. He falls to his knees and says that if he had known Italy was going to die so soon, he would have hit him less and talked about his feelings more, and screams Italy a few times dramatically. This is mostly a humorous bit, but honestly is one of the first times Germany is so open that he actually does like Italy, despite how much he rags on him. Italy is perfectly fine, just dangling in a tree somewhere, but I was still surprised at how sweet Germany's mourning was. 
As you've heard me describe, there's a couple weird concepts around the whole national personification aspect of the characters. There's the whole idea of being related, which is kind of weird since the characters are countries like I mentioned, but the show doesn't put much focus on it, so it's just kind of there. The other aspect of being a country that feels like it should matter a lot is that all the nations are immortal. You would think that would be a super interesting concept to explore, but for its first four seasons, Hitalia does not really touch on it. However, seasons 5 and 6 have a handful of episodes that deal with the lives of nations in a fairly grounded and interesting way. I mentioned it earlier, but these two seasons usually only adapt one story per episode, fixing that problem from the first four seasons. It also means that the episodes dealing with the eternal lives of nations that are kind of heavy aren't at all diluted by sketches attempting comedy. I'm not going to go that in-depth with these episodes because, one, if you ever do watch the show, it's nice to experience these moments for yourself, and two, they honestly deserve an in-depth analysis. So I'll just talk about the saddest one. Italia's most depressing and compelling episode is called Davy, and it stars a young America and, you guessed it, a boy named Davy. In early colonial America, America is playing by himself when he encounters another little boy named Davy. They become quick friends, but America has to leave, promising to return. When America does return, Davy has grown up into a teenager and pretends not to know who America is. The episode continues like this, with America coming back to Davy and Davy getting older and older. It shows America not comprehending time and his immortality as Davy ages while America does not. It's the first time we learn that all these countries didn't inherently know they were immortal, and that they would have to learn that early in their development. It's a painful episode, but it's also sweet by showing America's dedication and loyalty to his friend over what has to be 70 years or more. So to summarize, Italia has problems. A lot of them. Italia is also super funny with good characters and even has its sweet and touching moments. There's only one last thing that really affected my experience with the show. If you love history, and more importantly if you love making fun of history, this show probably has a lot you're going to love. The show is pretty funny and explains the history it uses well enough if you're not a history buff for the most part, but with some historical knowledge, it's even more hysterical. As someone who does love history, that really made the show even better for me. In fact, the first scene in the first episode of Italia is one of my favorites in the entire series because of how crammed full it is of historical references, in the English dub especially. It's a world conference with most of the major countries attending that immediately dissolves into infighting. From England reminding France of Agincourt, a famous battle from the Hundred Years' War in 1415, to America asking France why he doesn't go back to making green chick statues like he used to, to Russia intimidating former Soviet satellites like Lithuania and Latvia, which is honestly so accurate it's barely even a joke. As the chaos increases, Germany seizes control of the meeting by yelling at everyone and setting up some rules with stereotypical German strictness, before ceding the floor to Italy who just says, PASTA! Cute title card. Really weird. Really funny. And that's it. Weird most of the time, but funny most of the time. That's Italia. And that's why I like it. If you think you might like it, the first four episodes in the English dub are on Funimation's YouTube channel for free. And the first two seasons with subtitles are also on their channel for free. The rest of the show, sub and dub, is available on Funimation's site, but most episodes are only accessible with Funimation Now Premium. However, the latest season with subtitles is available on Daisuke as well. I personally like the dub and would recommend it because the voice actors do pretty good accents for whatever country they have. Unlike most dub shows where you feel like you've heard all the voices before because Funimation uses the same not very big pool of voice actors, Italia's accents really do disguise the voices and make them sound unique. But the Japanese voice actors are great too, so it's totally up to you. Italia is weirdly good, so if any of this seems to appeal to you, give it a shot. Hey there, it's Ania here, and it's only been eight months. I made this video because I really wanted to get out my feelings about Italia, and I hadn't seen much other than straight up reviews regarding the show. This wasn't much of an analysis, more of a discussion or even a retrospective, but I wanted to make it anyway. I have a few ideas in mind for new videos. First, a shorter video on this one Italia episode I absolutely love that I was originally going to talk about in this video, but I have enough to say about it for it to have its own analysis. Second, a video analyzing how the Haikyuu anime succeeds as a good adaptation from its manga, particularly in the finale of the second season. And third, a video on my favorite, and what I consider to be the best, scene in Kids on the Slope. 
Subscribe if you like this video or want to see any of the ones I just mentioned. Comment if you have complicated, or not so complicated, feelings about Italia and would like to share them. Also, check out my videos on Haikyuu's characterization, if that sounds like your cup of tea, or my video on Prince of Stride and its failure to have an interesting female protagonist. Until next time!